Today we're talking about another of the Apostolic Fathers, the document known as the Shepherd of Hermas. We're going to look at who wrote it, what it's all about, and a bit of its legacy. First though, let's cover a bit of the background. Long ago, when the Christian church was still pretty new, the Bible as we know it today just, well, it just didn't exist. In the first three centuries there were, however, many bits of Christian writing that those early believers thought were important to the church, and were often read out to a congregation, much like they'd be reading out a letter from, say, someone like Clement, or Polycarp, or Paul, and they were used for preaching and teaching. This is still going on today, in a fashion. Books like The Purpose Driven Life, The Screwtape Letters, Bible Commentaries, and even that prayer of Jabez that was super popular a few years back, are sometimes studied or quoted in either sermons or used in study groups. Now, they're obviously not given the high regard that scripture itself is given, but they are still used to help people on their journey of faith. It therefore shouldn't surprise you to learn that the subject of this video, The Shepherd of Hermas, was also treated this way. It was read out to believers and became very popular, certainly amongst the western side of the church. Clement, who we've already covered in a previous video, was a big fan of it, and quoted it in some of his scribblings. That said, once the official list of Bible books was compiled, the shepherd, alongside other well-known bits like the Didache, faded into the background. And having read it though, I can see why it was such a popular document back in the day. But I was also surprised to find out that it was also the basis for a well-known plot device that we still use today. So, go grab yourself a drink while the intro plays, and we shall dive straight into it. As with all such early documents in the church's history, the answer to who wrote this book is a very solid, we're not quite sure. The Apostle Paul didn't physically write a lot of his letters, and we know this because in his letters to the Romans, he mentions a gent called Tertius as being his scribe. And in another letter, there's a section where he makes a point that it is him writing this bit, and you can tell that because this is his handwriting. There is also the fact that there was a lot of writing back then that had got someone's name slapped on it to give it a bit more clout. Some nobody in the church may have written a really, really good helpful letter or something, but they would put the name of an apostle on it to make people take notice of it. Sort of like when you see the words executive producer of something that's got very little to do with the final product or sponsorship. However, in the case of the shepherd, we do have a few options for who might have written it. Now the first, is that Hermas is the same guy that Paul mentions in one of his letters, meaning that this could have been written quite early in the church's history. But then, the document does mention Clement, so that gives it an earliest date of about the late 80s or 90s CE. Later sources state that this particular Hermas was the brother of Pius I, which gives us a date range of around 145 to 155 CE. All of them point to one thing. A guy called Hermas wrote it and most of the evidence points to a chap called Hermas of Philippopolis. But let's get to the real meat of it, what it was all about. And if you're enjoying this jaunt into ancient church history, why not shepherd the like and subscribe buttons into your collection? The book itself is a story, much in the style of the book of Revelation. The whole thing is written in the first person, which has led to a bit of debate about if this is a personal account or if it's just a work of fiction written to inspire fellow believers. The tale begins, of course, with Hermas, who gives a little background on himself. When he was young, he was sold into slavery to a lady called Rhode, who he slowly came to love as a sister. And one day, whilst helping her out of the river after her bath, he pondered that if he ever married someone like her, he would indeed be a happy man. A little while later, whilst taking a walk and pondering the wonders of God's creation, Hermas fell asleep and had a very strange dream, which when he woke, realised was actually a vision from God. In this vision, he found himself by a river, and the heavens opened up before him. But instead of, say, God or Jesus behind the veil, there was his owner, Rode, who told him off for having impure thoughts about her. Hermas began to protest, but she shut him down pretty quickly, telling him that he's a righteous man and he should act and think accordingly. Reeling from the obvious calling out that he just received, he began to despair, but then noticed that next to him was a chair with a little old lady sat in it, and she was reading from a book, and she asked him why he was looking so downcast. He explains that a lady that he had got great respect for had indeed called him out, and while he's not sure how, it must be true that he'd had impure thoughts towards her. 
The old lady tells him to stay calm because God is not angry with him about this particular issue. But he isn't happy with Hermas either. God is upset because Hermas hasn't led his family to the faith and he hasn't brought them into the church and instead has let both his wife and his sons get up to all manner of stuff without disciplining them. She then begins to read to him two passages from the book that she was carrying, which are for the faithful and for the apostates and heathens. Then she literally tells him to man up before getting carried away as Hermas wakes up from his crazy vision. We then skip forward an entire year and Hermas gets another vision and finds himself at that same riverside as before, with that same little old lady there to greet him. This time she asks him to write a letter to all the believers everywhere and she gives him a book which details what he should write down to them. Hermas obliges the little old lady even though he can't actually quite read what he's transcribing. Fifteen days later he has yet another vision and again meets the little old lady but this time he plucks up the courage to ask what he'd written down in that first vision. Again, it is revealed that the message was for Hermas' family, as well his sons and his wife were still being unruly, and it still fell to Hermas to sort them all out. In this vision though, he is joined by a man who asks him who he thinks the little old lady is. Hermas has a guess, thinking that she's a prophetess, but it's a wrong guess. The little old lady is actually a vision of the church, and she's old because she was established quite some time ago. The old lady then asks Hermas if he had sent those teachings he'd written down out into the world yet, and when he admits, actually no I haven't, she's actually very happy, because she's still got some more stuff to send to them. Specifically, she wanted to send some letters to a chap named Grapti, and one important chap we've met before called Clement. It's clear now that old Hermas was given a fair few visions, so it's no surprise that he was yet to have many, many more. His next set of visions regarded a tower being built by some strapping young men. The old lady reveals that these men are angels, and the tower, along with the various bricks represented, were the members of the church. Now some of the bricks were nice and brick-like, and they slotted straight into the tower. Others, however, were rounded and didn't fit, but with the slow chipping away of impurities, they will one day join the rest of them. Yet others were rejected, and thrown into a fire which burned them away, and others were thrown to one side, and this whole thing is very reminiscent of the parable of the sower. Hermas asks several more questions and receives more visions, which reveal that the old lady church has been getting younger in every vision, as the church is growing from strength to strength as time goes on. They go into more detail about the composition of the tower, and of course the church. And then, then we get to vision number five. And if you're still here, why not make the vision of me thinking that you've hit subscribe and click the like button a reality? Now where were we? Ah yes, vision number five. Vision number five is where the book gets its name, as in this vision, Hermas is visited by a glorious stranger who is dressed as, you guessed it, a shepherd. And this dude has some stuff to say, because for the rest of the book, this guy is doing all of the teaching. Now, if I covered it all here, well, it might look as if I was only interested in that fabulous metric of watch time that all of us creators crave because this guy tells Hermas a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff. But as this channel barely makes any money, I'm happy to just give you the Cliff Notes version. So basically, the teachings of the shepherd tell us a lot about Christian ethics in the first few centuries, because this is generally what the rest of the document concerns. Ethics. As always, I have left some links in the description so you can have a read yourself, but the shepherd does talk in parables and allegories that wouldn't be out of place in any of the Gospels or any of Paul's letters. He talks about how to give charity, how to fast, how to deal with your unfaithful wife, how to conduct your prayers, and how to conduct yourself in the manner of someone who fears God and not the evils of this world. Now I did mention that famous plot device and it's one that's even appeared in Disney movies of all things. And this is that concept of little angels and devils that sit on your shoulders who try and pull your decisions one way or the other and it is mentioned first here in The Shepherd of Hermas. Heck, the shepherd kind of alludes to the fact that he is actually the guardian angel of Hermas, which is yet another concept that is a part of popular culture nowadays. Along with documents like Dante's Inferno that would arrive centuries later, we can see a non-canonical document informing Christian thought and the wider culture. So that's the book, but what of its legacy? Well, although it was a very popular document in the church in those first three centuries, it was not universally loved. When it finally came time to figure out which books were going into the Bible, 
the shepherd got rejected. And this is possibly because while the whole thing is about the church, it doesn't mention Jesus, not even once. It does mention a son of God, but never their name, which I guess was a bit too vague for the official Bible. It might have also been left out because of its solution to the God and man being the same thing question, as it seems to go down the route of adoptionism. That is, Jesus was born as a normal person like you and me, and then became the son of God later by, you guessed it, becoming the adopted son of God. This view of how the mechanics of Jesus worked was also quite popular back then, but again, it was put to one side at the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. Another thing that might have swayed the decision was that the version of Christianity it was portraying was very Jewish in flavour, and as time went on, the church was trying to untangle itself from its Jewish roots to become its own unique religion. It also portrayed a Christianity that had some Montanist flavours. Now Montanus, the chap who started this particular movement in Christianity, was declared a heretic, so to have some ideas floating around that were a bit similar to his, well, that was clearly a no-no. All this said though, it is clear that this was an influential piece. After all, we're still talking about guardian angels and the shoulder devils centuries later. But alas, because it did not make the cut, it went the way of a lot of those early church documents that I had never heard of until I started my degree, and neither had any of my church-going peers who joined me on that. Next up, we're going to be looking at a chap who gave us a bit of insight into the early oral traditions of the church, Pius of Heriopolis. So do feel free to subscribe so you don't miss the next part of church history. Until then though folks, please do grab yourself a drink, don't listen to that devil on your shoulder, and keep asking questions, and I will see you next time.